My friends, for the last three years, you have watched me in this little corner, and I would hope it is as familiar to you as your front room, for example. But sadly, today is the last video I will be filming in this room. But don't worry, I'll soon have a brand new set and a lot of the shelf stuff will be coming with me too. Right, now we've got that out of the way, let's get on with today's video. Hello all and welcome along to another episode of Flat Earth Friday with me, Simon Dan. Thank you very much for joining me. So for the past two weeks I've done my absolute best to debunk Eric DeBay's latest video, which itself was a reply to a 20 month old video of mine. Today is the final part of this little mini series as we finish off Eric's video with another thorough debunking. We've ruined his attempt at explaining solar analemmas and the differences between the Antarctic and the Arctic. Can he do any better in part three? Let's find out. In the flat earth model of the cosmos, these Arctic and Antarctic phenomena are easily accounted for and exactly what would be expected. If the sun circles over and around the earth every 24 hours, steadily traveling from tropic to tropic every six months, it follows that the northern, central region would annually receive far more heat and sunlight than the southern, circumferential region. Since the sun must sweep over the larger southern region in the same 24 hours it has to pass over the smaller northern region, its passage must necessarily be proportionally faster as well. And this is a key point. The sun does not move at different speeds. It moves at a constant 15 degrees per hour. A 15 degree per hour drift. Thanks, Bob. Which begs the question, why are you bringing it up? This is why the Antarctic morning dawn and evening twilight are very abrupt, whereas in extreme north, twilight continues for hours after sunset, and many midsummer nights the sun does not set at all. I see you've not addressed it whatsoever. How very transparent. Dr. Samuel Robotham said, if the sun is fixed and the earth revolves underneath it, the same phenomena would exist at the same distance on each side of the equator. But such is not the case. What can operate to cause the twilight in New Zealand to be so much more sudden, or the nights so much colder than in England? The southern hemisphere cannot revolve more rapidly than the northern. The latitudes are about the same, and the distance round a globe would be the same at 50 degrees south as at 50 degrees north. And as the whole would revolve once in 24 hours, the surface at the two places would pass underneath the sun with the same velocity and the light would approach in the morning and recede in the evening in exactly the same manner. Of course it wouldn't. You have to take into account local conditions and climate. Have to. And the distances are the same at 50 degrees north and 50 degrees south. Flights take similar times, for example. Yet the very contrary is the fact. The constant sunlight of the north develops, with the utmost rapidity, numerous forms of vegetable life, and furnishes subsistence for millions of living creatures. But in the south, where the sunlight never dwells, or lingers about a central region, but rapidly sweeps over sea and land, to complete in 24 hours the great circle of the southern circumference, it has not time to excite and stimulate the surface, and therefore, even in comparatively low southern latitudes, Everything wears an aspect of desolation. Which we've talked about, Eric, last week. Link is in the description to go back and watch that one. These differences in the north and south could not exist if the Earth were a globe, turning upon axes underneath a non-moving sun. The two hemispheres would at the same latitudes have the same degree of light and heat, and the same general phenomena, both in kind and degree. The peculiarities which are found in the south as compared with the north are only such as could exist upon a stationary plane, having a northern center, concentric with which is the path of the moving sun. I think old me is back in a second. This is word salad of the highest quality, make no mistake. Orbiting the sun, a globular shape, and axial tilt are the reasons why there are seasons. No scientific textbook will ever say it's because of our distance to the sun at any point in our orbit. I believe you call that one a straw man argument. No, it's called critical thinking. <laughs> of course it is, Eric. Of course it is. Sorry, continue. A straw man argument is what you set up with your questionable solar analemma photo earlier. Um, 
I don't think it is. A straw man argument is when you refute something that is not the argument put forward by the other side. For example, you're saying it's ridiculous to have seasons because the distance to the sun changes throughout the year. Yet that isn't the reason why we have seasons. I'm not sure how a solar analemma can be a straw man argument. It's a simple observation that you used when you were explaining how it goes around the disk. What you're witnessing here is an example of a sovereign-minded individual, unblinded by heliocentric pseudoscience, critically examining the claim that summer solstice and the highest recorded temperatures on Earth happen when the globe is allegedly farthest away from the sun. But Eric, during that time, the southern hemisphere has the coldest recorded temperatures. It's not all about the northern hemisphere. And besides, the distance changes are irrelevant. Lastly, Dan rambles off a list of geologic processes which he claims, with no evidence, somehow explain all the radical flora, fauna, seasonal, and temperature differences between the Arctic and Antarctic. Well, no shit! The North Pole is on a sheet of ice that sits on water, and the South Pole is an enormous quantity of ice that sits on a continent. To expect them to be exactly the same is just silly. He rambles on more about the differences between the Arctic and the Antarctic regions, and that there shouldn't be any differences at all if the Earth was a globe. Well, to start with, we don't expect them to be exactly the same, but what Mr. DeVay doesn't understand is there is so much more to think about when looking at these regions. As you know, I've talked about this in depth in the last video. Our orbit around the Sun is but a tiny factor amongst many. You need to look at the temperature difference between the equator and each pole, how water and land absorb and emit radiation differently, the air and water currents around each pole, the local geography surrounding the polar regions, the depth of the ocean below the Arctic, the land mass below the Antarctic, the albedo effect, the ice thickness at each pole, etc, etc, etc. So he says there are many factors I'm not considering that cause this, and the very first one he lists is, you need to look at the temperature difference between the equator and the pole. Yes, an obvious one, isn't it? Telling someone to look at the temperature differences between the equator and the pole is not providing evidence. Well, once you look that up and factor in everything else I've said about it as well, then you start to build up some solid evidence as to why there are differences. Nor a contributing factor to anything. I'm well aware of the temperature differences, and I've presented them in my books and videos showing how they are wildly inconsistent with the globe model. Dan then lists several other things I allegedly need to look into, which he again claims with no evidence will somehow explain away all the heliocentric model's problems. Yet you are not going to discuss all those things. Why not? It's almost as if you know that there are very good reasons as to why there be differences between the Arctic and Antarctica, yet you just hand wave dismiss them. Eric, you have a lot to learn. If you could stop reading old books written by scientific illiterates, that would be great. And then stop uploading videos about the content of those books, that would be good too. Oh, and don't forget to enrol in a local astronomy course. That would help. Yeah! Sci-fi scam man Dan, you too have a lot to learn. If you could stop listening to Freemasonic liars in lab coats and spacesuits, that would be great. Um, okay, but then how will I debunk people like you? And then stop uploading videos where you repeat verbatim everything you were indoctrinated with since kindergarten? That would be good too. Well, that's never going to happen. Oh, and don't forget to sign up for IFERS, the International Flat Earth Research Society. That would help. Hello? Is that IFERS? Hi there. Yes, it's Simon Dan. Simon Dan? Yeah, honestly. Yeah, no, Eric, he told me to call up. He recommended that I, uh, that I join. Seriously? You want to what? Jam a nine iron into my anus sideways? Charming. Well, you don't know science. Told them. Right, well, this is the point and the, and the final time I'm going to ask Eric to debate on this channel against MC Toon on the reasons why there are seasons. Again, please, please do email me, Eric. We'll get this sorted. Come on. Right, well, there we go. That wraps up our little mini series on Eric Debay. I do hope you enjoyed it. If you did, then please, please do like and subscribe. It'd be thoroughly appreciated. I've been Simon Dan. Have yourselves a great weekend. And I'll see you all on Tuesday with a brand new set.
See you all then. Bye-bye.